Hi, good brothers and good sisters. Welcome to another Toy Guys Talking, and I'm super pumped and stoked to be talking to Bob Bariansky, who is what we call Larry Hama, the godfather of G.I. Joe. Uh, Bob is the godfather of Transformers for me. I'm so happy and uh, and grateful that you took the time out to chat with me today and, and all uh, the viewers on the channel, too. How you doing, Bob? Great, and I'm happy to be here. So you, just before we started recording, um, you corrected me on the pronunciation. Now, growing up reading the Transformers comics, there was never any interviews with the folks behind the scenes. There was never any special features. It's not like today. And so I grew up thinking it was uh, Budiansky, Budiansky. But I swear, is it the Mandela effect? Was there an issue or a couple issues that credited you as Bud Budiansky? Or am I imagining that? I think you're imagining that. Okay. I would have noticed. Okay. I think you're imagining. <laughs> okay. Because for, I, I got. Frequently, frequently people over the years call me Bud, but they juxtapose my first name with the beginning of my last name. I think that's what's that happening. And I, I got to apologize because for 25 years, I knew you as Bud Budiansky. <laughs> And so I've been working hard to rewire my brain. It's Bob. It's Bob. I, now I, you know the. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, it's called Toy Guys Talk. So before we start getting into the actual character uh, writing aspect of Transformers, which I'm dying to talk to you about, I want to kick it off with some toys. What What were some toys that you grew up playing with, and how important were they they to you? Wow, that's a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> See, usually people want to talk to you about eighty eighty three, right? Eighty four. And let's yeah. go even further back going, than that. Going back 20 further years, uh, yeah. which is really, really digging deep. Uh, what toys did I play with? I remember having like, like Lincoln Logs type toys and um, like a building toys, you know, like construction toys. Yeah. Uh, I remember playing a lot of board games like Monopoly and Scrabble. My old Monopoly set. Yeah. It predated me and I've, I've been around for a few years. I have, I have a Monopoly set where the pieces are made out of wood, which is really rare. Um, what else? Um, what other kinds of toys? Uh, you know, I used to play ball outside a lot with kids, you know, with ball, different street games in the Bronx. That we used to play punch ball and stick ball and off the wall, a lot of things like that. So I'm trying to think toys. What other toys did we play with? Um, I mean, I had toys. I just, you know, those are the things that stick in my mind. I don't remember too many others. Yeah, we talk on the channel a lot about how... Um you know, toys really affect the, the upbringing of a person and the Transformers particularly really nurtured and cultivated a more like intellectual, cerebral um, kind of mindset. And I'm not surprised to hear you played with building blocks because that's what Transformers basically are, right? You, you build yeah. something or trans... Yeah, so building, you know, structures and buildings and like things like that, yeah. And you transform yeah. it and stuff. Um, and yeah, I know you've been asked every possible question about, uh, the writing aspect, uh, the comics, the Transformers, but what about the actual toys? Did you actually get to see the toys when you started working on Transformers? When I was brought aboard, all that we had were the toys. We didn't have anything beyond the toys. As you might know, um, probably know, Hasbro's original deal on the Transformers was they, uh, made some kind of an arrangement with, with two Japanese toy companies. Takara and Bandai, and they basically took the toys that already existed and rebranded that rebranded them as Transformers, uh, changed their colors around so that they were, you know, they were Decepticon colors or Autobot colors or whatever they thought were the right colors, and so they took pre a pre existing uh, bunch of toys and just made it Hasbro Transformers toys. So when I was given reference materials, what I was given were the actual toys. I didn't have anything else. Uh, as time went on and Transformers proved very successful, Hasbro would then uh, come up with whole entire new lines of toys that did not pre-exist. So at that point, you know, toy designers would provide uh, myself and everybody else involved with uh, model sheets. So these are actual diagram diagrammatic representations of the Transformers in their various forms, you know, whether they were more robotic or more creature or more vehicle-oriented vehicle or whatever they're supposed to be doing. So I would see the model sheets at that point. But initially, I just saw the toys. So a lot of people watching the channel, I'm sure, are, are fully aware of who you are and your contributions to Transformers. But for the people out there who aren't aware, you created a lot of the names. You came up with the the names. You wrote the tech spec bios on the back. You gave these characters their character. 
Um, so do you remember um, the process of creating some of those characters? What inspired some of the personalities? Because the arc bots, as they're called, and those original Decepticons, they all have such diverse personalities. It's not just me, alien robot, kill you, alien robot. Yeah, I tried to go a little beyond that. Yeah, that's true. Um, well, okay, so uh, again, as you and maybe your audience knows, I originally was given the assignment of writing the Transformers, uh, 26 of them, over a long weekend in November in 83. <laughs> yeah, I just I just read about that. that that's brutal. <laughs> so that was after um, my, my former boss, uh, Editor-in-Chief Jim Shooter, who had did the initial treatment, tre the initial treatment of Transformers, he wrote that. He had assigned it to a senior editor with a lot of writing background and said, take this treatment and expand on it. Give all these characters names and personalities, et cetera. And I was not involved in that in that point. But what I do know is that um, Jim did not uh, approve of the work that was turned in. So rather than go back to that particular editor writer, he decided to move on. And he asked several other editors with more writing experience than I had at the time including Larry Hama, who, who you mentioned. Um, and uh, they, he said, you know, can somebody take this assignment? I need it, you know, over this long weekend, which didn't make it that, didn't make it that uh, appealing for a lot of people, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and uh, they turned him down, like two or three, four other editors turned him down. And they finally came to me. And I had a reputation as a, being an editor who drew, not an editor who wrote. But I figured, oh, this is an interesting opportunity. Sure, why not? So over about a four-day period, maybe, at most, uh, I had to turn in this work for the following Monday. It was the Monday right before Thanksgiving, which is a holiday here in the States, the last the last weekend of November. So he wanted to get this in on Monday so he can get to Hasbro Toys before the Thanksgiving holiday. So I was under the, you know, kind of under the gun. I had a, a bit of a crunch period to get this done. And I did it. I Over the weekend, I, I renamed um, or came up with names for 24 out of 26 of the characters. Of the characters, Optimus Prime was a name that we kept from the previous writer, uh, and some other one of the other names we kept. And I named all the other ones that I had to rename, or came up with new names for the ones that he hadn't gotten to yet, perhaps, and came up with the character profiles. So going back to your original question, like how did I come up with all these different personalities? I don't know. You know, I mean, I was just trying to plug things in where I thought they fit. Like this guy is a jet. He's a bad guy. This guy is a an ambulance. He's a good guy. I was trying to find references in my whatever my vast uh, media uh, popular culture knowledge of the time was uh, whatever I could pull out of the my you know my brain like okay I can uh, I can come up with a personality uh, that's that's inspired by this actor in this particular role in this movie for instance yeah and I could, could disguise it enough so you don't know it's supposed to be Indiana Jones or it's supposed to be a Clint Eastwood in a western or it's supposed to be you know, so up some other character that I that I had some connection to, and that's how I did it. I just kind of looked at my my library of knowledge about popular culture and my influences, and came up with and maybe people I knew. Maybe you know, it was a long time ago. I don't remember everything. Um, and some of the names I came up with were also inspired by again popular culture. In the 1960s, there was a TV show on uh, the NBC network called uh, Ironsides, which was which involved a uh, uh, Raymond Burr as a police detective who was uh, bound to a wheelchair, and his name was Ironside. That's what good name. Ironhide. Yeah, so that's how I came up with Ironhide. You know, and um, I needed a medic. So um, okay, medic. Well, there's Nurse Ratchet from One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, and a ratchet is a tool. So yeah, medic named Ratchet. Yeah. That's a good name for a medic that's mechanical sounding. And so on and so forth. You know, I just spun them out of wherever I could pull it from. Yeah, everything is, is derived. Like a lot of writers, creative people, they really bang their head against the wall. And they're trying to come up with that original new idea that will set the world on fire. And they don't realize that all of the stuff that inspires them so much is just derived. It, it's, yeah. it's derived from th other things. But the secret is, I think, not to come up with a new thing, but... Put in a fresh coat of paint on a previous idea because this stuff just resonates through the centuries but we need to update it we need to you know make it relevant for the 80s for the 90s and now 
uh, in this, you know, decade too. So I think that's the real magic that um, Transformers was fresh and new, but it was also so familiar. And I love how those original Transformers all had human personalities pretty much, even though they were ancient aliens from another planet. We had the narcissist, we had the little brother, you know, we had the noble, um, self-sacrificing hero. Even on the other side, we had that, you know, um, the usurper, whether it was Starscream or uh, uh, Shockwave. So I think that's the secret. And, and also, I just wanted to tell all the young people who watch the channel here um, who are interested in, well, it doesn't matter what aspect of life you want to get into. Opportunities are rare. And when they come your way, you got to grab them. And your, um, your history is a perfect example of that. Even though the timing couldn't have been worse, you got to grab that opportunity and you got to exploit it to its maximum potential and just kind of put whatever um, occasion is on hold for a couple of days because those opportunities, they don't come along very often, right? I think you said it perfectly. In fact, I've said very similar words at various interviews and panel discussions about my involvement with Transformers. It's exactly right. When there's an opportunity there, don't wait for the next one. Grab that one before it disappears. You're exactly right. Um, so Optimus Prime, my ultimate hero, I've done a lot of videos on him and, and how much he meant to me. And uh, what I do on my channel a lot isn't just what I call hands in the shot. Sometimes I do those. Those are fun. Um, looking at the toy. But I like to talk about the synergy, really focus on the importance um, of it's the toy, but it's also the comic and it's also the cartoon. And it might even be other aspects too, but one isn't complete with all the other ones. So I like reminding people, hey, you know, this this toy that you love so much, the reason you connect with it is the character. And uh, I love your uh, interpretation, your writing of Optimus Prime in the comic book. And I'm you know, sure that's been spoken uh, of a lot. But I just recently reread the Headmasters four-part series. And it reminded me why I love Fortress Maximus so much. Now, this is a character that got almost no screen time in the cartoon. So, you know, for a long time, I've been wondering, why do I love this character so much? It's just not, it's not just because he's a big robot. And rereading that comic reminded me, you gave him all of the nobility that Optimus Prime had too. So I just wanted to thank you for making Fortress Maximus like the inspiring beacon of light that a lot of people forget he is in the comic. Oh, well, you're welcome. And you probably remember the character far better than I do. Yeah, since I'm you sure. <laughs> but okay, I'll accept that. Thank you. <laughs> uh, on the, on the uh, subject of Fort Max, so as I'm reading it, I couldn't help. Uh, and I, this is what's great uh, about talking with you directly, because it's cool if you don't remember it. It was a long time ago, but maybe you will, just because it might have been a real irritant at the time. So I'm reading this great story about the head is a guy named Galen and... Then he gets killed off and they bring in Spike. And I'm thinking, did they tell Bob, okay, you got to kill this guy off because we got Spike. The toy is Spike. And I'm wondering, what was that conversation like? Where, you know, was Bob saying, give me a break here. I, I've got a character named Galen. And, you know, when they make changes like I, that. To I wish I could remember that. But, <laughs> certainly. but it wouldn't surprise me that, I, that somebody told me Spike has to be brought into that character. But I, 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 I gather... You know, I, I remember um, what, what, I, what a little I remember of Headmasters. Didn't they start out on a planet Nebulos or something yeah. like that? And the, this group of Autobots had to somehow bond with the some of the natives in order to keep the peace or something like that. Yeah. And, um, and so I was probably starting from that, um, that, that initial position. I had to move it from there to combine one of them with Fortress Maximus, I guess. With Spike, who's not from Nebulos, yeah. so I probably had that in mind from the beginning, but that's a lot of speculation. It was a while ago when I wrote those stories. Yeah, yeah. and there's also that whole issue of the character was originally, uh, I guess, called Spike, got changed to Buster. That's right. And then they said, "Well, you got to bring in a guy named Spike because the toy <laughs> is called Spike, right?" He was, he was, he was, what happened was, okay, so I, as I mentioned earlier, Jim Shooter wrote the original treatment. He named the character Spike, Spike Witwicky. Okay. And, um, and somewhere along the line, I think somebody at Hasbro didn't like the name Spike. So he changed, he changed it to Buster. I actually have the initial, the original treatment, the original typewritten treatment that 
he had a secretary or he himself may have typed up. Um, and then all the names that have spiked are crossed out in my handwriting because he told me change it to Buster. So I have that treatment with my handwriting crossing out spike and changing it to Buster. Now, it's very likely, and again, I'm not part of every process that went on back then. It's very likely that at some point before those changes were made or before my uh, my edited copy was um, passed on or made copies of and passed on to other people, um, that an unedited unedited copy got cha got transferred over to Sunbow Productions, and, that was, and they were making the animation. So Spike remained Spike, yeah. and I continued to Spike. I know he was movie is, the movie that that poster behind you has Spike in it. Yep. Right. Uh, where was the movie? He's in there. So he be, he continued to Spike. And it was and like, yeah. And it, the comic I think is written so well uh, under your run and Simon Furman's as well. But there are moments where when I was reading it, and I haven't read the whole thing in ages, but just in the segments, um, reading through it uh, in recent years, I can always tell where there's like, they messed with him. They came in and they said, okay, you got to bring in a Spike. And it's like, but Buster is Spike. Well, he's an older brother now. Or when they uh, increase the size of Fortress Maximus, I don't know if you remember that, but there's one panel where they're... Um, uh, increasing his size and it's so arbitrary it's like okay he's got to be bigger and badder mistake of an artist i don't know i mean i i don't want to say what hasbro told me to do and what they didn't tell me to do because i don't remember everything most of what i did they were very approving of but it wouldn't surprise me that an artist just got well, it wrong no I, in that case they are actually mentioning they're acknowledging that they have to increase his size and they've added okay, the extra okay. head, which he didn't have in the four-part series. And that, that to me, uh, was one of those moments where I was like, just just let the writer write a story. And I know it's supposed to sell toys, but it is what it well, is. Well, that right? was the possibility of that book, unfortunately. So, yeah. like, as much as I enjoyed writing the book, as I said earlier, and as anybody who followed the Transformers back then knows, it was a very successful toy. And the whole point of the comic book was not to sell comics. It was to sell toys. Yeah. So... Every time Transformers uh, increased its line, Hasbro would bring out another 20, 30 ca uh, characters, toy, toys that had to be introduced to the comic book. I had to find a way to, sh to shove aside everybody that I had been playing with yeah. in terms of, terms of storylines and bring in new characters and create new storylines. And after a while, that became you know, more of a burden than I was willing to put up with. So I was, willing, you know, I was, I was looking to leave the book for... You know, for at least a year before I finally left it, because I just felt like I understand what I understand what's going on here, but this is just becoming too much of a of a of a chore to figure this out to have to take all these characters that I develop and then cast them aside and then start all over again. Yeah. So I, I talk and with then you're paying attention to when new characters were introduced. That's when I was being interfered with. Yeah. And I just recently read your last uh, issue of Transformers. That's with the MicroMasters. And again, when um, in the little omnibus that I, I read, there's notes too saying this is Bob's last issue, and he you know handed it over to Simon. He recommended Simon, and I thought it would be the MicroMasters where you would say I've I've had enough. <laughs> like I've got a great storyline going, and now I have to talk about these little things that you know. It's just out of the blue. It messes with the I flow. I don't think it was that MicroMasters in particular. Like I said, I was trying to get off the book for quite a while. It would have been, yeah, a and, while. Uh, my editor uh, was just begging me, please stay for another issue, another issue. I don't have anybody to replace you with. And um, I so happened, I had met Simon a couple times. I knew he was writing the the uh, British fill-in issues of the Transformers. And um, and I met him a couple times, and I went to England for a vacation in the early 1989. And we met for lunch. And I said, hey, Simon, do you want to take this book from me? You know, take it off my hands. He said, sure thing. And um, and that's what happened. Now, just a little side note, as the writer of a comic book, it is not my job or my responsibility or even my um, ability. And I don't have the authority to say to another writer, please take over my book. That's the editor's job. Yeah. But uh, in that case, the editor was agreeable. And so I, I was able to move on. Well, it's nice in a situation like that where you're allowed to just kind of off the cuff say hey this guy would do pretty good you know you, you never want to especially in creative situations make it so black and white uh that no that's you know someone telling you you've overstepped your bounds 
We don't do that here. You can't do that. We have a process. Well, you can't make magic with these strict, stringent processes, right? It's like on a film set where the director wants to set the light up and someone goes, nope, we have union rules. You can't do that. The guy's like, yeah. okay, all right. Yeah, everyone has their job. I think in this case, I was able to give the editor a choice he could live with you know, rather than just say, I'm leaving, figure something out. I said, I'm leaving. Here's a really excellent option. Here's a guy who has experience in these matters. You've met him before when he visited the Marvel offices. You know what he's like. So I gave him a good option. And that was the key. Yeah. yeah. And, the, and the last thing that I wanted to, well, thank you about the Transformers comic was uh, one of my all-time favorite comic issues of any comic is the Power Master Optimus Prime issue, which, again, could have been such a simple easy uh, toy commercial comic and there actually was a commercial on tv get the new comic it's power master optimus prime so that's what it was intended to be but uh and, and it was very similar i thought to when i talked to buzz dixon a writer for the gi joe animated series a few years ago uh where he said you know we didn't treat it as a toy commercial we treated it as an opportunity to tell amazing stories about these incredible characters that just happen to have toys so He's exactly right. I was unaware of the commercials. Right. I knew they were existed, but I wasn't like, you know, cross-referencing what I'm doing with what they're going to be doing in a commercial. I was unaware of it. Yeah. So that story was really powerful, and I think it had a major effect on me. And um, I think that that story in particular really sums up what you brought to Transformers. It wasn't just about lasers blasting and cool jets doing fights in in, in the sky. Over here. So you say Power Master Optimus Prime. What was the story about? I don't remember Power Master Optimus Prime. So what, 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 what it was, was it, it was uh, the Autobots had his um, uh, essence on the disc, and they bring it back to Nebulos, which we mentioned before, and they said, "You guys have the technology. Can you build him a new body?" So they say we could, but we've poisoned the fuel here uh, because of the stuff that happened last time you guys were here. So he'll only be alive for a few minutes. And they said, "Well, do it because that would a few minutes of real life is better than." an eternity on the, on the disc. They bring him back to life and he immediately hunches over and he's in pain and dying and they all apologize. They go, we're sorry, we've basically doomed you to a, a quick death. And he says, no, thank you. And that to me is pure Optimus Prime, that he thanks them for a few more minutes of life. And it really, you know, as a young kid reading this comic, uh, helped illustrate to me how precious life is, that every moment is precious and here's this larger than life robot instead of ah oh, oh no why me going thank you for every last moment and that's some it's a lesson i've never forgotten enjoy every moment that sounds like a pretty good story you wonder who wrote that <laughs> <laughs> but bud <laughs> booty <laughs> i love that okay yeah, i had just, some good ideas back then <laughs> absolutely beautiful story and and thank you for writing that because it it was really uh, powerful and influential to me and and so many other transformers fans um so that was your run on transformers uh what happened after that uh well like i said i was trying to get off the book because i wanted to move on to other things now uh, you and your viewers might or might not be aware that writing transformers wasn't the only thing i was doing while i was writing transformers i was a full-time marvel editor so that was a you know a nine to five job minimum at, at minimum more than nine to five usually, and um, so I had a full time job. I was writing a book a month, and I was doing occasional illustrations. I, I, as you might know, I I drew an occasional Transformers cover, um, and I did some other odds and end drawings here and there for Marvel. And um, but I wanted to move on. I had to develop my own idea in my head that I wanted to turn into a comic book. That was Sleepwalker. Yeah. So uh, once I got off once I got off Transformers, I. I spent a lot of time developing my sleepwalker idea. I submitted it through the Marvel process. You know, just because I was an editor didn't mean I automatically got to print whenever I wanted to print. You know, Marvel, you know, Marvel had its standards. Hopefully, it still does. Um, and so, I went through the process and got tweaked here and there. Um, got up, got kicked up to the editor in chief. He liked it. He tweaked it here and there. And then, then I was, you know, then I continued on my job as an editor while um, beginning beginning to write sleepwalker for the next. I don't know, almost three years before mm -hmm. the book. So that was a lot of fun because I was able to, I mean, as much as I like Transformers, what was great about writing Transformers was um, I wasn't um, held back by the Marvel Universe. So when you wrote a Marvel Universe book, which is a wonderful thing if you can swing it, um, 
you know, that's great, but you also like have decades of all of this continuity that you've got to be aware of, and you have to be careful that if you're going to introduce uh, a guest star, you have to check with that editor to make sure that guest star is available, that you're using it properly, and so on. With Transformers, I had none of those restrictions. I, if I wanted to create Cybertron and show what it looked like, I could do that. If I wanted to create the creation matrix, I could do that. If I wanted to, you know, create a whole new world for the headmasters, I could do that. And um, so it was a very big sandbox I got to play in. And similarly with Sleepwalker, since it was my character, and although there were crossovers with Marvel characters who existed in the Marvel Universe, I was able to create my own cast of characters, my own cast of villains, my own mythos behind Sleepwalker. And so it was a very liberating experience. Um, plus it was in the Marvel Universe, which which was a lot of fun because I did get to, you know, uh, guest star Spider-Man and, and, and Ghost Rider and Deathlock and so on and so forth. And <laughs> and Marvel is all the rage now at, at the theater and the crossovers are all the rage too. So for yeah. any Sleepwalker fans out there, uh, I wanted to ask you, who would be your dream casting to play Sleepwalker in the movie? Well, ironically enough, there is a Sleepwalker movie. When would that come out? <laughs> it didn't come out yet. It's a fan film. Oh, okay. I was okay. I was talking like the Disney, but uh... I, know, I know I got you there. But no, but um, a real film crew with a with a person behind the person uh, in charge. His name is uh, Josh Knopf, based out in Florida. And um, he got a real. He's, I mean, this is what he does for a living. He does uh, uh, videos and commercials and things. And he got a real film crew and real actors. And um, it's like 98 percent done, from what I could tell. Uh, he started it a couple of years ago. It's all out of his own pocket. Uh, he f even flew me down to do a cameo. I oh, have my, that's awesome. Even a family moment in it. And uh, so I know who the perfect sleepwalker is. I've seen him. <laughs> I did a scene with, uh, well, the human part of him. And <laughs> But, um, you know, that's a, that's a good question. Mean, but on, on a more um, uh, commercial level, as far as answering your question, like who would be in a real sleepwalker movie, who would be cast as sleepwalker? Not, not saying that's not a real sleepwalker movie. That, that sounds like a real sleepwalker movie to me, but you, you and your fans go to Facebook and type in sleepwalker and there's a whole page dedicated to it. You can watch the trailer. You know I mean? It's like, it's a real thing. There's a movie poster and everything. It's sounds really great. Awesome. In fact, uh, back in, uh, in the fall, Marvel put out a four issue limited series of sleepwalker, uh, tied into some infinity wars crossover. And um, so it was the first time Sleepwalker had his own book in a couple of decades. And um, interestingly enough, um, one of the covers, which shows Sleepwalker rising out of the, out of the sleeping head of, of, of Rick Sheridan, his, uh, his, host, his human host, one of the covers from that was directly copied from the movie poster that my friend Josh made. So somebody at Marvel must have like checked in on the Facebook page or something and said, hey, that would be a good image to put on a cover. Yeah. <laughs> So the little crossover there. But anyway, as far as like ca Hollywood casting, the thing about Sleepwalker is he's he's kind of a guy in makeup. You know, he's not like a real person. He's a bug-eyed monster, the way I always describe him. Yeah. So it could be almost anybody with muscles, you know, because once you put that, that face over him, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess there's a certain, he has a certain tone and a certain voice. So, um, you, know, he's a, you know, he's kind of otherworldly. Maybe Keanu Reeves. Oh, you know, that could work. Like, or with a bug-eyed monster uh, CGI mask over him or something. A little bit you know, of an exotic has, look there, yeah. You know, he has that kind of voice that could maybe work for, work for Sleepwalker's voice. My go-to for everything these days is, because I can't keep up with all of the new generation of actors, I just say Tom Hardy. <laughs> <laughs> he, he could he could do... Uh, yeah. I haven't seen him yet, yet you know. Um, but maybe, maybe, okay. So yeah, you cool. actually got to revisit Transformers more recently. You uh, did the uh, movie adaption for IDW. A couple years ago, yeah. right? that was in 2006, not that recent, but yeah, uh, IDW came to me originally. I was the editor on the movie adaptation that Marvel did back in 1986, mm -hmm. but then 20 years later, I became the writer, and uh, it was fun, you know. It was, it being, movie adaptations are interesting because you know you're working with a product that's already done, so what you got to do as a writer, at least what my experience was, you just have to pick and choose, like, oh, here's a script, what you know, you can't do an entire whatever it was, 90 minute, 100 minute movie and a few comic books, but you can, you can streamline it and boil it down to the essentials and then put a little connective tissue in there to make sure it flows. And so that's, that was my job. Uh, and a little side note, I was just at the uh, TFCon in Toronto this yeah. past weekend, and I got to meet Ron Friedman. We did a panel together. Ron Friedman, the writer of the Transformers movie. And he was great. He was great. We had a great panel together. Uh, you know, he explained uh, how he came, how he, how he was, what he, what he was tasked to do in the first place when he was approached to do it, 
and then how he went about doing it. And uh, he's still getting a lot of mileage out of it, I guess. He gets invited to TFCon. So uh, that was a, a fun experience for, for me and for hopefully for him as well. Yeah, that's another thing to keep in mind for anyone who wants to get into any type of the entertainment business. Um, you know, one of the things that I often tell people who ask for advice or, you know, I say uh, fall 99 times, get up 100. Um, you're you're going to have a lot of failures. And you, if you're lucky, you'll get one. And if you're really lucky, you'll get two hits. And that you never know, maybe 20, 30 years, people will remember you for, you know, that uh, one big or two big hits that, uh, and it doesn't seem fair because you put so much passion in all your creative, uh, uh, you know, your creations, uh, whether it's writing, painting, music, there's musicians who put so much passion into every song and they can write 200 songs. They're known for that one hit and that must just drive them crazy. It's like, but I got all these other great things. I think, um, you know, I'm not the first one to point this out, but, you know, if you want to be a success in anything, you have to have perseverance yeah. and you have, you can't take, and you can't take no for an answer. Yeah. And, uh, if, if you don't mind, since you brought up the subject, can I give you my Marvel origin story, my personal Mar Marvel origin story? Absolutely. What you said. So I was in college. I was, uh, going for a master's degree in transportation engineering. I had already shown my, uh, I'd already been working for the student newspaper for five years as an artist and for, as a graphic arts editor. So I had some art skills, um, and uh, one of my one of my newspaper colleagues, um, who was the arts editor, which is basically like the film editor and music editor and so on. Um, uh, so anyway, he graduated the same year I did. I went. I stayed for another year for a master's. Um, he graduated the same year I did. And he got a job at Marvel Comics, uh, and as an editorial assistant in the Marvel British department. And so several months later, around the holiday season, I'm down visiting New York City, which is where I grew up. And he says, you know, why don't you bring your samples, your art samples, and I'll show them, you know, come up to the office, and I'll show them to the art director. I show them to the art director. So I went up there, brought my samples. He introduces me to the art director, who at the time was Marie Severin, who was uh, a terrific artist. Uh, she just recently passed away. Um, and I went into her office, and I'm sure I was like one of, you know, probably 20 kids just like me who would traipse through her office in the last week or two, showing their samples. And she looked at him, and she said very nicely, uh, you should find another career. And I said, okay, you know, I left, told my friend, you know, okay, she doesn't like my art. Um, anyway, a few months later, back in, like, this is like in December, so back, like in May, my friend calls me up and says, hey, Bob, I'm quitting my job as British editorial assistant. Do you want to interview for my job? And I said, sure. So I had a half hour interview with his boss, my future boss. And even though I was, 400 miles away in Buffalo, and he was in New York City. Uh, he said, you know, I wish I could see you in person, but everybody here says, has nice things to say about you. So um, anyway, I got the job over the phone, a half, half hour phone interview. Wow. And so, and, you know, my friend told me, don't tell him you want to be an artist. If you tell him you want to be an artist, he won't hire you because he, he'll know you want to quit. So anyway, I got in. It soon became apparent that I wanted to be an artist and I had some art skills, some, some very, you know, baby step art skills. And the art director for our department, with Marie Severin. And Marie Severin, I'm sure she didn't remember me at all. Uh, once she became aware that I was a I was a budding artist and I wanted to, you know, become a comic book artist, she couldn't have been more she could not have been more generous and kind and constructive and a better teacher, best art teacher I ever had probably. Um, and and I became an artist. Eventually I became an artist. I started, you know, I started getting regular assignments and so on. And so my point is, you know, if I listened to her the first time, I wouldn't have been there the second time. Yeah. That's something I continually say on my channel. Be very, very careful about whose opinion you value. Uh, and people are very, they got it backwards, I always say. They're quick to injure and slow to heal. And it, it needs to be the other way around. And being a uh, YouTube guy, um, you know, I've also learned that you get a lot of criticism. You get a lot of nitpickers. And what's been a value to me is to put a spotlight on every single person who has a criticism, who has a nitpick. Because usually people are just allowed to say, you suck, or that sucked. And then you get hurt. And that's kind of the human process of being criticized. You suck. Oh, no. And what's not natural, what's not uh, typical, is someone goes, you suck, and you, you know, grab the, I'm not going to grab my light here, but, you know, kind of like that interrogation light, and let's... I always say, who are you? What have you done? 
show me what you've it's like that line in the uh michael keaton movie what have you risked and when i started doing that uh, i started to find out the people who have those criticisms have accomplished nothing and it's kind of like a it's a self-loathing i think letting off steam kind of thing they feel bad about their lack of oomph chutzpah and well, they're like I, I i want to defend marie for a moment here like well, Again, not saying that's what she's like, but there are a lot of critics like that. A, with a tremendous talent, and B, she probably literally had a, a parade of people just like, you know, artists want, Marvel, Marvel artists wannabes going through her office, you know, constantly. And she had to say, okay, you know, it you have some potential. Habit. You know, you don't have it, you know. And, you know, I mean, it wasn't like she was there because she wasn't skilled. She had some skill. Yeah. Uh, I, I, what I learned, the valuable lesson I learned from that is, I mean, over the years, I was, a Marvel, I was at Marvel for 20 years. I was a, a full editor for 13. I went to a lot of conventions. I met a lot of wannabe artists who showed me a lot of samples. And, you know, the vast majority of them weren't ready to work in comics. But I never said to anybody, find another career. Yeah. What I, people as well, if you want to become an artist for Marvel, you're going to have to practice a lot more. You're going to have to work on this, that, and the other thing. You know, I try to give them some constructive uh, information. And uh, then it's up to them whether they want to pursue it or not. Um, just recently, I was at a convention in Kentucky, and um, uh, somebody who, whose work I admire but I had never met before, an artist named David David Finch. So I think he's mostly known for Batman. He's a tremendous artist. Um, he 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 introduced. He was sitting a few tables for me, and he came over and he introduced himself. He said, "Hi, Bob. I I really you know I've been wanting to meet you for so long. We met once before." I said, "Really? What happened?" He said, "Well, I came up to Marvel in 1992." with my mother, you know, I guess he was still like in high school or something. Yeah. And I guess he, he said something like, you know, I, I showed my samples to somebody and he said they weren't ready yet or something. And he and his mother go back to the hallway and get in the elevator. And I happened to be in the elevator. Now I have no memory whatsoever about this, but he said, I wanted to thank you because I showed you my work and you gave me a lot of constructive criticism for that two minute elevator ride. And, and now he's like a superstar. So I'd like to take all the credit for what he is today, but I can't do that. I mean, he, I'm sure he put it all, you know, put all that hard work in to make him, himself the artist he became uh, and has become. And, uh, but it's, it's very satisfying to know that you know, I could say something and turn somebody in a such a way that it could be helpful and it could lead to some uh, positive result like that. Yeah, it's stunning how something can just seem so small, uh, but it's ripples in the water. You know, 20, 20 years later, they go, you created a tidal wave, uh, yeah. you know, and thank you for that. Do you still uh, do art? Yes. Yes, I do. Um, well, I go to conventions, I do some sketches, but I, I take art commission work. Uh, so people are always, I have a backlog because I'm slow. And do, I have a do you do much so, uh, Transformers art? Uh, some, mostly, most of the commission is a Ghost Rider, actually. Okay. You know, which I prefer, but to be honest, sorry to break it to you Transformers fans out there, I really don't like drawing robots. Uh, <laughs> it's a lot of work. I mean, I know I know there's generations of artists who've grown up on Transformers who just, that's all they want to do is, is draw robots. But um, for us um, old timers or, you know, earlier generation of artists, you I know. I call like it vintage. <laughs> it's vintage is a good word, yeah. Um, yeah, so, so and, and just, to, you know, pointing, pointing out like, Whatever you might or might think, you, your audience might or might not think of, uh, might, might or might think of the uh, artwork, the artists that were hired to do the Transformers books in the original Marvel run, those were, those were extra vintage, okay? Yeah. Uh, super vintage artists, you know, guys from another generation. And again, they didn't like drawing robots either. They liked drawing superheroes and beautiful women. And, um, and, and so it was a chore for those guys. I mean, they, they, were, they were professionals, so they, they did what they were supposed to do. But it was not their first choice to sit there and have to look through reams of um, reference materials to draw these robots correctly or as correct as they could make them within the limitations of the reference they had. Uh, it was it was a challenge for a lot of these guys. But they did you know, overall. I think the artists I worked with did a great job. But it's not something they relish doing. Yeah, I think all of the artists on Transformers were incredible, but especially at the end of the run, Stephen Baskerville and Andrew Wildman. Their mm -hmm. art was mind blowing because they started to draw a lot of battle damage. And so it wasn't just, this is what the guy looks like with all his panels and stuff, but they would draw like wires popping out of the neck and panels loose and wiring inside dents, scratches. I also noticed that they, that those, those are both British artists. I also noticed that they were 
they were really into humanizing the faces much yeah. more than the artists were. The American artists felt a little bit constrained by the fact that they're supposed to be robotic looking. And these guys didn't let that impede them in making them look very emotional and very plastic in the way their faces moved, which I think really gave them a lot of juice that maybe some of the early, early artists lacked. I agree. The, those later uh, issues, because the story, um, when Simon Furman, uh, he brought in Unicron and he went into the whole lore of um, Primus, uh, the god of Transformers and all that, you really needed that intensity and that, you know, that angst screaming. Mm -hmm. He would, e they would even draw them with spit coming out of their mouths. You know? <laughs> For oil, for, for oil, <laughs> exactly. Um, another thing I wanted to ask you about was uh, how, how has the fandom changed over the years, uh, interacting with fans in the '80s versus uh, today? Just just as recent as this past weekend in Toronto. Well, in the '80s, the fans were were not present. They were just you know they would write letters, but they weren't trans. The thing, the the idea of a Transformers convention did not exist. So there was no interaction with fans whatsoever other than receiving letters in the mail. Um, today, you know, with, I, I guess I first started going to Transformers conventions or being invited to go in about 2006. I went to one in Chicago and I go to, you know, I've been to a handful since then. Uh, and the, 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 the fans are, are tremendous. I mean, I, 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 every time I go to one of these conventions, somebody, at least some one person, usually more than one, will come up to me and explain to me how, they read my books when they were of an impressionable young age and how it changed their lives and, you know, affected their career choices and so on and so forth. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm flattered. I'm always kind of like making jokes about myself. Well, you know, they say, they say, you know, you were, you were a major part of my childhood. You, 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 you made me what I am today. I said, well, I apologize. You know, I'm sorry. I, you know, I'm, you know, I'm joking. <laughs> I mean, they're good people. They're good people. I mean, it's, it's, it's when you, it's, a, it's, 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 a it's an immense responsibility that I, ne that I never, I never uh, knowledgeably, wittingly, wittingly accepted. It just happens. You know, you write a comic book, it goes out there in the ether, and it affects certain people certain ways, and you can't control it. But people tell me about all these positive role models I created, and you know, these these moral choices that my characters made, and how it affected them. So it's it's very, uh, it's it's very, um, what's the word? Um, uh, you know, fulfilling to hear these sort of things. You know, like okay, that's great. What's, I was doing it for a paycheck at the time, but now that now that I know that I created the next, uh, you know, uh, Mother Teresa or somebody, you know, that somebody is going to do good for the world because they read my Transformers comics 35 years ago. Uh, yeah, it's a nice thing, nice thing to hear. Um, so it's been, anyway, back to your question. So how has fans changed? You know, I wasn't even aware that there was fandom because you know, as far as I was concerned, when I left the book in 1989, the book was dying, the toy line was dying. I wasn't paying after I left the book. I didn't really pay much attention to it. I mean, I was vaguely aware of uh, Baskerville's and Wildman's artwork because I looked at the pictures, but I didn't read the stories. So, um, and then it, the book was canceled for a number of years, and then I guess Beast Wars revived it to some extent in the, in the 90s, and um, and so on. Then the movies came along. I wasn't paying attention. I think what happened was when 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 the internet evolved enough to that people would start going on to do self searches of themselves and type in their name and see what yeah. popped up. So this is maybe around 1999 for me. Maybe I, I came to this moment around then. I typed in my name, and I saw there were these transformer these, these transformer sites where people were ripping me for stories I'd written 15 years earlier. You know, and I'm thinking, get a life. You know, I wrote these stories for 10 year old kids. You know, back yeah. in the 1980s, and so, you're still talking about them. those are the critics I was talking about earlier. Oh, but I mean, but I'm making a joke here. I didn't really care. You know, yeah. this is like, not, it doesn't affect my everyday being of who I am. And then people would speculate because I was no longer involved in the Transformers world that I had somehow, you know, dropped off the map and I was living as a recluse under a rock somewhere. And uh, it was, it wasn't until I did a couple of interviews, online interviews, where people started liking me like, oh, Bob's such a nice guy, Uncle Bob, you know. Yeah. And, and then all of a sudden I started getting good reviews on my old stories. You know, people were starting writing. <laughs> Good reviews about you know what a wonderful writer I was back then, and none of it really matters because it was what I did back then. I wasn't doing it for an audience 15, 20 years later. Uh, but it was very interesting how this whole um, underground, at least to my mind, of, of Transformer fans existed that I was completely unaware of until the internet started evolving and started uh, people started putting up websites devoted to the Transformers and talking about uh, the old stories and everything. So um, I guess. All I could say is, overall, the, the trend has been 
more and more fans, bigger and bigger attention. Um, it just keeps growing. And I think it's a, an important lesson for people to remember, uh, again, like when I started this out, um, I just, I wanted to share some excitement. I had been seeing people doing pop culture stuff with scowls on their faces. You know, they'd be talking about this new movie came out or we're even talking about the coolest, newest toy and, you know, sucks, worst toy ever. And, uh, you know, I, I just, I, my stuff makes me happy. So I, uh, I thought, well, someone should be enjoying this stuff. And there's a lot of people who do. Um, but, uh, the point I wanted to, to get to was we do things as jobs and we, we think to ourselves, okay, I'm, I'm paying the bills. That's the purpose. That's my intent. My intent is to, to do a job, not to inspire, not to, you know, um, influence, um, and what I would say is that might not have been your intent, but it, that was your effect. Uh, and you do that. I, I believe you did that in your writings just because of what you got in your heart and soul. Um, it, it doesn't matter what the job is. You're still going to put that in everything that you do. It's you're going to, um, you know, uh, there's this uh, expression from way of the peaceful warrior written by Dan Millman where his definition of a warrior, he says, a warrior does not give up what he loves. A warrior finds the love in what he does. A peaceful warrior. Not like a Conan the Barbarian type of guy. And that's been a very powerful um, thing for me to always keep in mind that you're not always going to get your dream job, but you can pump gas at the turbo with all of your love and passion and treat people like human beings with respect. And you never know when that ripple in the water is going to turn into a tidal wave all those years later. So I think you and Mr. Hama uh, and so many other uh, talented writers, artists working on those comics back then, um, and even the toy designers too, uh, writing the bios, I think you put the love in the work and that's why uh, it's lasted this long. And I think that's why it still resonates to this day. Because there are some things that don't. You know, like there are uh, certain toy lines that just had a short shelf life. No one really remembers them all that well because there's no characters. There's no heart and soul to them. They were 100% driven by profit. But uh, the, the characters that you help create, they'll last forever. Uh, yeah. So I think that's why people will uh, have been and will continue to come up to you and just try to express in words. And uh, Alan Watts said... Uh, the real shame about the English language is we can't put what we feel in words. We just can't relate in words how we feel. Ah, but poets come close. So uh, I think that's really wonderful that people uh, are going to conventions to meet you. And just just to say thank you, to say, uh, you know, what you did had an effect, even if it wasn't your intent, it, it was the effect. Yeah, and I don't mean to uh, sound too... Um a mercenary about it. I said that was just a job. I mean, it's a job I really enjoyed doing. I did it to the best of my ability. And in the back of my mind, I was aware that I had a responsibility to my audience not to put things into my stories that were, that I wouldn't think were morally correct. You mm -hmm. know, I, it was a bad guy doing something immoral, but he's a bad guy. But, you know, the good guys had to ultimately, you know, be representative of values that I thought people should should have if they want to be good people and the bad guys should be the, the mirror reflection of what, what you shouldn't be doing. You know, what, what, how evil needs to, uh, needs to be thwarted and, and how, how, um, how, how it manifests itself in so many different ways. And you have to be cognizant of it and always vigilant and be ready to combat it. And that was kind of where I was pulling out my, my, conflicts from you know with those thoughts in mind that uh, and and again i was re i was trying to reach out to a young audience i was aware of that i needed to be aware that i had this responsibility to not put things in there that i would um, th think would be inappropriate for them so yeah. i don't know it's something that i've recently uh, been made aware of too because you know i i, I don't even think of really of who my audience is other than you know people like me uh, and then when I go to some of these conventions and someone comes up to me and I think, oh, cool, someone who watches the show and they go, my son is your biggest fan or my daughter um, is your biggest fan. And I just I go, wow, like I, I didn't even think, but it's uh, it's a very humbling experience. Um, sure. 
the uh, the code of honor uh, ethics um, uh, that stuff that was in the Transformers comics that came from uh, your writing. Where do you think that came from? Is it just has it always been there, or did you pick it up from something that you uh, grew up on? Um, I, I'm sure whatever that code of honor was, uh, you know, like the, 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 I mean, Transformers. Most of them, not all of them, showed up on Earth and, led by Optimus Prime, realized that that you know that, that even though there are these powerful aliens and they have no connection to us really, um, that they had a responsibility to protect us and 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 try to um, work with us and and make sure that they that we would not be fall harm because of their fight and you know to greater or lesser means greater or lesser degree they that's what they did not all of them most of them. Um, where that came from, I, I guess, you know, I had good parents, I had good, good, good values at home, That's uh, what it is. watched a lot of, you know, a lot, a lot of movies and read a lot of comic books that would probably professed a lot of these values as well. Um, you know, so, I mean, comic books was a huge influence in, uh, on me when I was a kid. And back then, and then when I was reading comics in the 1960s, the comic books were a lot more black and white, you know, nowadays, not just nowadays, but for decades. You know, there's been a lot of gray in a lot of comics. You know, like you know, heroes are anti-heroes, and you know, you have characters like Punisher and Wolverine, and you know, a lot of characters who, who are a little bit over the top. Um, and you wonder, well, is, is there is there means to an end justified in, in, in our world? But back in the 1960s, you know, Superman, Spider-Man, Green Lantern, they did, they always did what was right. There was very little doubt about, you know, what was right and what was wrong. Um, and uh, so between reading that, watching certain certain genres of movies, being exposed to my my immediate family, my extended family, uh, and the, you know and how they influenced me and how I was raised, I guess I, I just became a decent person. I, 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 I would like to think of myself that way anyway. And I guess that expressed itself in my writing. I would agree with that. Um, it, it's one of the reasons I haven't really been able to get into the newer Transformers comics because of that grayness that you talk about. And that's just a reflection of the world. And uh, it's something that I've noticed over the last couple of years um, when I really sat down and, and dwelled on it. Uh, Stranger Things played a big part in it, too, because I loved that show so much. And I went, wait a second. You know, we've really changed from this just happy-go-lucky, uh, good-natured, uh, they never cross the line, not just in entertainment, but, you know, just the way people would treat each other. And these days, uh, you know, I think a lot, most people would uh, agree that people aren't quite as outgoing, as willing to uh, empathize and connect. Uh, so uh, when that seeps into entertainment, I'm like, I don't need my, uh, you know, the real world in the entertainment. I want to go back to the days of Superman and Captain America. I think that that's a, that's why the Marvel cinema universe movies, you know, the movies produced by the Marvel Studios generally are so successful because the audience, the audience gets heroes they can root for. Mm -hmm. That's simple. It's really hard to pick any Marvel Universe movie, Marvel Studios produced movie, and say, I don't know about that guy, you know, like among the heroes. You know, like you pretty much know this guy is, is a good guy, you know, through and through, uh, the moral choices they make are always on the right side or just about always on the right side. I mean, sometimes I'll make mistakes, but they won't make it because they're, they're gray. They make it because they, you know, they're human and they make mistakes. Yeah. But, uh, and I think, I think that's why, you know, pe people really are gravity, you know, they, that's why those movies have had such tremendous success and people love those movies generally. Yeah. Cause they're just a hero is a hero. I, I work with some young people and um, I've noticed this trend, which it was, really bizarre to me the first time I heard and then the 12th time I heard I was like is this a trend um, uh, helping kids with their writing uh, and I, I would talk about well what inspires you and I'd get a, a weird look like what do you mean I'm like who's your hero and there's so many young people who don't have a hero and I, I try to needle and prod them and go come on like you might call it something different but a hero like someone you look up to you you want to emulate or someone who lights the way anybody and a lot of kids just they sit there and they go i don't know 
That's unfortunate. Yeah, I don't know. So I, I always recommend, why don't you crack some uh, 80s comics or put in some 80s cartoons? Uh, <laughs> you won't have any trouble finding some heroes back in that era. And uh, Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, Bob, it, it, we're at an hour right now, so um, I just want to thank you so much uh, for you know chatting, answering some of my questions, and uh, you know talking about Transformers and, and other stuff. Um, I just want to close with, uh, do you want to talk about what you're working on currently? Um, well, I kind of said it earlier. So, I mean, I have a day job which has nothing to do with, um, with comic books. In fact, I, I kind of alluded to it earlier in our in our uh, texts back and forth. I was saying, I was setting up a, a movie tonight. I'm the recreation director for my town, and we have a free movie series in the summer every Tuesday night for eight weeks. And the uh, high school kid who's supposed to help set it up couldn't make it tonight, so I had to go out there and help set it up with one of our public works people. So um, it was a fun job. I love doing it. You know, I have day camps and, you know, senior citizen programs and Easter egg hunts and all sorts of things like that. Uh, but aside from that, I'm more comic book related, um, I do art commissions on the side. So when people contact me, best way to contact me probably is through Facebook. Um, I'll get you on my list. I don't make I don't make promises I'll get to your art anytime soon, but I don't take your money either. So it doesn't cost you anything. Um, and that's that's been that's my major connection these days. That plus going to occasional conventions when I get invited to be a guest at a convention. So um, but I, I actually I'll, I'll, let me let me correct myself. Mar Marvel just contacted me a couple of weeks ago. And for the first time in over two decades, I got an assignment from Marvel. Marvel's doing a special edition. I hope I'm not giving anything away from Marvel's point of view. They're doing a special edition called Marvel 1000 to commemorate their 80th anniversary. And they, invite, they invited a whole bunch of um, artists and writers to do one page of any character they wanted, a one-page story, anybody they wanted. And, um, and that, that proved to be so successful. I don't know how big a book it is. I don't know if it's 20 pages or 100 pages. But that proved so successful that they're doing Marvel 1001, as a continuation of one Marvel 1000, I got invited to do a page for Marvel 1001. So for the first time in a couple of decades, I did a one page story for Marvel. I wrote it and illustrated it and it's Sleepwalker. Oh, cool. That's that was awesome. the one page Walker page coming up in some, some edition sometime soon. Oh, that's awesome. So everyone check that out. Yeah, uh, once again. On for that one page. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks again, Bob. And whenever I uh, try to set these things up and I don't do too many of them because you know, it's like, the old saying don't meet your heroes because you, you just you never know someone might be having a bad day and then you have that you know like anytime you look at their creation you have that memory so but um you know I, i'm just i'm so elated to see that you are everything i thought you know you would be uh, that I, I saw from your writing in transformers you are a real life hero and uh i've just had you know the best time chatting with you i really thank you so much and uh, you know maybe we can do it again sometime uh, but uh, nope. just thank you, thank you, thank you. Everyone check out uh, 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 that uh, issue coming out soon. And uh, yeah, uh, hit up Bob on Facebook. Look for me on Facebook and uh, send me a message. <laughs> awesome. Hope everyone out there enjoyed this chat. And until next time, nerd mistake. So long. <laughs>